All right, thanks everyone for joining us today for creating healthy habitat for creepy crawlies. Uh, we were able to put this educational event on thanks to grants from East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, as well as Collins Aerospace. And then we received some supplemental funding for this webinar and for our larger Creepy Crawly campaign this month um, from the organic businesses, Mountain Rose Herbs and Moon Valley Organics. I am gonna go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, Suzanne Wainwright Evans. She's a horticultural entomologist that specializes in integrated pest management. She's been involved in the green industry for 29 years with a primary focus on biological control and proper pesticide use. She's a graduate of the University of Florida with degrees in both entomology and environmental horticulture. She's the owner of Bug Lady Consulting, which has been in business now 20 years. Please leave your questions for Suzanne in the Q&A box um, in the bottom of the screen and then we'll have Suzanne answer those during our session at the end of the webinar. Suzanne, we're thrilled to have you here today, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, well, thanks for having me, and it's nice to work with you guys again, because I've actually been out uh, to the left coast out to, to work with you guys before, because I actually live in Eastern Pennsylvania, even, it's funny, most people think I live in Florida. Now I'm getting a lot of people thinking I live in California, <laughs> but I actually live in Pennsylvania. Prior to COVID, I pretty much uh, would get on a plane every single week and be all over the U.S. and Canada and down through the Caribbean. So I think that's why there's a lot of confusion um, of where I actually live. Sometimes I used to think I lived in the Charlotte airport because I was uh, there so much. But uh, for today, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my screen going for you guys so that we can go on on the bug stuff. And I'm kind of keeping an eye because there's actually a couple wasps in my room buzzing around my head. So I'm sure if I just don't bother them, they're not going to bother me. We're not quite sure how they got in the house, but they're in here. Um, but uh, for today, um, I'm going to kind of follow up and go a little bit more in depth about some of the information in the video that was covered. Um, the challenge with doing uh, these webinars is because there's such a diversity of people um, that you could be anywhere on the planet and attend. And it's challenging sometimes um, because recommendations you may do in Washington state will be different than what you do in Pennsylvania would be different from Florida. I saw somebody was on here from South America. So um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit with, with the plants. And so you'd be very careful about plant recommendations that they're gonna be right for your zone. Um, so it's something to think about as we discuss a lot of this and you have to think about what's right regionally for you. Um, what I do for a living is I work mostly with commercial greenhouse growing operations. Um, these are examples. The top left is on top of a building in New York City. Um, that's uh, lettuce hydroponic production. The bottom left is croton production in central Florida. The lower right is cannabis out on the west coast. I work a lot with hemp and medical cannabis. And then the top right is in California, um, poinsettia production. And what I do is I work with commercial growers. And first of all, I do a lot of insect identification and then help put together an all-inclusive program for pest management, but we mainly focusing, focus on using beneficial insects. Just like there's chicken farms, there's insect farms, and they're called insectaries. Um, there's an excellent insectary in California called Beneficial Insectary, and they provide a lot of beneficials to North American growers, um, where again, they have this little bug farm, and then these people that you see on the screen buy those bugs, and we release them by hand, uh, we have blowers, and now over the last two to three years, uh, we've been moving more into drone applications because more and more acres are being treated and the cost of labor is going up. Um, it's hard to get people to work in agriculture. So we're looking at more automated ways to, re to release these beneficials. Um, just because they're using beneficials does not mean they never use pesticides, but we try to manage the pests first preventatively with beneficials and only as a last resort do we come in. Um, also, there are not commercially available beneficials for all uh, pests out there. But that's what I do is I work with these people to overall reduce uh, the, uh, the overall pesticide use uh, 
for for me, it's very much about environmental reasons. Um, it's also very important for worker safety issues. And also, um, there's been a lot of issues lately with pesticides being overused and the pesticides not working as well as they used to because the insects have developed resistance to it. Just like how with humans uh, from overuse of antibiotics, we have resistance there. The same thing has been happening in the insect world. And we've not seen any of the pests develop resistance to being eaten. Uh, that's one of the things I say all the time, you can't build resistance to being eaten. So we can perpetually apply these beneficials without worry about um, it not working. Um, it will continue to work. So this is another location I work at in North Carolina, Metrolina. And you know, I find a lot of homeowners aren't aware the level that we are doing biocontrol at. This is a mum field outdoor, it's only a small portion of it. And the pepper plants along the front are actually providing pollen to beneficials. So it's basically like putting in little feeding stations all along because a lot of the crops we grow don't have pollen or nectar until they come into bloom and many beneficials require that in their diet and so when the insects would come here they'd look at that field of mum and say hey that's a food desert i'm not stopping but now that we're able to provide pollen and nectar through these ornamental peppers and in, in this picture here uh, we've been able to release beneficials that will stay as well as attract in other native beneficials. We've changed how we do it a little bit um, and now instead of doing it in the line we're doing in these blocks here and we're testing different plants and observing and seeing which plants bring in what beneficials and they actually now are signing it which I think it's very important for marketing to allow people to know hey instead of just going out and spraying we're doing these things to attract in beneficials and preserve the ones that are being released. It's been a very successful program and this was I think the fifth year we did it down there at Metrolina. So the thing with insects um, and and uh, you know I tell people oh I work with insects they're like ooh gross and you know what when kids are little they love bugs. Kids are so into insects but as a society through other people through advertising we're totally taught that they're bad, they're dirty, if you know there's one on a plant it needs to die. Um, if we see one at our home, you know, we need to spray. That's not necessarily true. And I really think we need to kind of reevaluate how we view insects because they are so important. I mean, we, we can't survive without them. And I think that we do need to focus on education and focus on educating kids that they're not something to be scared of and we do need to live with them because they are so important to us. I mean, everybody know, everybody's focused on pollinators this day, pollinator, pollinator, pollinator. So, you know, and that brings us food, um, which is really essential, but they're also food sources to other animals. Insects are really important for birds and other mammals. They're also decomposers and recyclers. I say to my friends all the time, imagine if we didn't have insects cleaning up the dog poo, how bad your yard would be. So, I mean, they're important for that. They're also being used in the medical industry um, for uh, using maggots to clean up wounds. Um, I mean, and they also use leeches. Leeches aren't insects, but they're also being used uh, for treatment and cleaning. Also pest management, which is a huge growing area of, of using beneficials more and more to control pests. And then also entertainment. I mean, everybody's been to a butterfly garden. So, I mean, they're, they're really an important part of our society. And I think we need to reevaluate them and not give them the gross status that we tend to assign with them. Even though Halloween's awesome because this is the best time of the year for me to find insect clothing and insect things for my house. Um, but, you know, we do really need to think about how we teach our children about them and teach them to appreciate them. Now, attracting and beneficials is something I get asked about a lot, and there's not one necessary clear answer that every that is one answer for everybody. You kind of have to look at your situation. And one thing is, is when you go and Google, Google it, there's a lot of anecdotal comments online and a lot of stuff that's not scientifically based. Um, you know, five, six years ago, when you would go look online, about you know attracting beneficials, you would see things like plant marigolds and and plant impatiens and petunias. And you know we know now that a lot of these plants that have been heavily hybridized or cultivated for 
what we want are not necessarily what uh, the insects want, and they're not really good floral resource, resource plants. Also, when you look at these lists, you have to think about what growing zone you're in. Um, I grew up in zone 9B, and now I live in growing zone 6, which, which borderline 5, which was a huge change for me. So the things I did when I lived in South Florida in 9B, I cannot do up here. I can't even grow the same plants people grow in Philly an hour and a half away from me. So you have to know your growing zone and think about that. And I think it's really important just to observe what's going on around you. And that's what I did when I moved from, you know, tropical to Pennsylvania, um, I just started looking at plants and trying to select plants that I thought might be good for attracting and beneficials. Um, I throw this picture in of marigolds because I am not a marigold fan. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, people planting them in their garden to repel insects, but yes, they attract insects, but how's it going to repel and attract them at the same time? I think marigolds is a very pesty plant. Um, they get spider mites, they get thrips, they can get powdery mildew. Um, I think it's one of those, they've been elevated to this mythical status without a lot of science to back it up. Um, so I think what you do, should do, and this is what I've been doing here, I have seven acres, is um, I go with the rule of three. I plant three of the same plants each year and I try different things. And then I just go out and look at them for a few minutes. And I'm like, huh, what's visiting that? Is that things I want? And if I see a lot of uh, flies coming, because flies are really good pollinators, you can see some of the native beetles and honeybees. Honeybees, yeah, those are what I want. If there's nothing happening and you're watching and watching and watching, for a resource plant for beneficials and for pollinators stuff, that might not be your best choice. Does that mean you shouldn't plant them? Absolutely not. You know, we want beauty for ourselves in the garden too, but you know, kind of observe and see what's going on there. And there's actually been some research doing this. Um, this is one of the, um, I think, studies that I found the most interesting out there. This was done uh, through Purdue University. Uh, Cliff Sadoff, who is an amazing entomologist there, he does a lot of work with Emerald Ash Borer. They did this project where they took a euonymus plant, which is notorious for having euonymus scale. And what they did is they looked at some perennials and planted them around them to see if they could bring in beneficials to help manage the pests. Um, they wanted to stagger bloom periods so that they could have uh, those pollen nectar resources for the beneficials through the season. And this is kind of how they put their test plots out. They had low flowers, no flowers, high flowers. And then again, they used a combination of these different plants here, which again, are gonna work for all growing zones. Um, you know, for the Northeast Corridor, these would be good plants. Uh, what was super interesting about this is the first thing, we all know this, that when they had these flowers around the euonymus plants, it they had the most abundant beneficials there. It brought in beneficials. That's the easy part. What has been very interesting about this, and this has been replicated in other studies, is they removed the blooms off the plants. And what they found is it didn't affect the patterns of natural enemies abundance or dispersal. And what they're finding, and the University of Maryland, Paula Shrewsbury has looked at this too, is that they think it's more vegetative characteristics of the plants, height, textural difference, and things like that, that will bring in biodiversity and beneficials than just the blooms alone. So having those textural difference and height differences in your landscape is really critical um, to have this. And for decades, what have we been planting? Monocultures of same height, same everything. Perfect example, your lawn. Perfect example, a hedgerow. Um, and we know now that in order to really encourage these beneficials, we need to break away from that. Now, there's been more work done uh, attracting beneficials, and we know that diversity is important, but again, getting into the plants. One plant that is heavily used um, as long as you are not in super hot areas is alyssum. Um, you can see the alyssum here, um, and this is being used in a botanical garden. Alyssum has proven to be a really good plant for things like minute pirate bugs and surfeit flies, which are excellent beneficials to have around. Minute pirate bugs love to feed on thrips and things like spider mites. If you're growing roses, some of your biggest problems are thrips and spider mites. And so this way you can provide the pollen nectar down below so the predators can go up and get their meat out of the roses and then come back down. So this has been a really good planting combination 
uh, several of my ornamental growers actually put the alyssum in uh, their greenhouses in pots and we use them as a banker plant to feed them. Uh, again, in the south, it gets too hot in the summer and this peters out, but I found this to work really well in the, in the northern cooler climates. And right there you can see one of those minute pirate bugs just sitting there waiting to go uh, find some food to eat. Now Penn State um, did an amazing trial and I wish every state could repeat this or at least in each like growing kind of zone what they did is they looked at 88 perennials and they looked at how they establish, can they suppress weeds, how much maintenance, when did they bloom, aesthetics, they looked at all these characteristics. But what I was interested in is bringing in the beneficials. And for pollinator diversity, um, they actually found, and these are the top eight plants they found, the pygnantiums. Um, I've been planting more and more of these. I can't get enough of them for my yard because of, uh, of the, for me, it's the flies because I want flies. I know people are like, ooh, flies, but no, flies are pollinators, flies are predators. There's a lot of great things about flies um, that it brings in. Uh, things like Joe pie weed, goldenrod, milkweed, rattlesnake master, which I grew for the first time this year. But you can see on this list are not the traditional, very famous kind of plants that are sold at garden centers. Sometimes these are a little, I had a, a little bit harder time hunting down those rattlesnake master seeds. Um, but again, it was nearly impossible to get seed this spring, so I should be grateful I got what I did. But this should be done so that, yes, you can have your designer pretty plants. Like I love my yellow peonies. I'm always going to have those. Are those great for beneficials? Not really, but I can plant these around to provide diversity and also the pollen and nectar resources. They also just looked at sheer number of insect visits outside of just pollinators. And again, the pygnanthiums, the golden rods, the joe pie weeds, these were all really good for bringing in all kinds of insects um, there. One of the things, again, I've got this love affair with flies and absolutely love to canid flies um, was, I, you know, when everybody talks about pollinator research, they're always looking at the bees. I'm like, well, who's, who's looking at flies? And the canid flies are important is because they, um, they the, the larval stage is predatory. And here we have a stink bug and right on the back of its wing, you can see that little fly egg on there. They'll also um, help, They'll also feed on things like caterpillars, and there's several different insects that these decanted flies will feed on. The adults are pollinators, the immature stays is, is what it eaters. So it's a win, win, win to have these decanted flies around. And actually, this, um, this was on some mint in my yard. Again, pygnanthium is a kind of mint. Um, and uh, they're really good for that. So that's why we want these hairy little, what people think gross looking flies, I think Around, um, so that they can be predatory in their immature stage and pollinators in their adult stage. So they did do bee and surfid fly visits. Now surfids are a type of fly. It's a family of flies. Um, they're not as hairy as uh, the tachanids, but again, for visits, you know, the pygnanthium, the goldenrod, tick seed, the coreopsis, uh, species are really important to have in there. And we really want these surfeit flies around. Why are surfeit flies important? Um, and again, surfeit flies are a family. Not all of them are predators, but a, a chunk of them are. And they love to feed on aphids. Um, I think everybody's pretty familiar with aphids uh, in their garden. Um, and aphid numbers can become really high really fast. What happens is the adult mama surfid is like, mm -mm, aphids, and then she'll come in. And you can see the aphids in the middle, but to the right, these three grains of rice, those are fly eggs, and those are surfid fly eggs. And then those eggs will hatch and start feeding on those aphids. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a nursery or a facility where people are like, oh, we've got aphids, we've got a spray. You know, I'm like, no, no, let the eggs hatch. You'll get your little larva, let the larva feed on it, and they'll control the problem for you. I've had uh, situations, and it just happened again a few weeks ago, somebody emailed me a picture of a surfeit fly larva, said, I've got caterpillars, how do I kill it? Like, no, it's a surfeit fly larva, it's predatory, it's there probably feeding on your aphids. So it's really important to identify these things. So 
with these surfids, you have these beautiful adults that are pollinators that mimic bees, but they only have uh, two wings if you look, where bees have four wings, but the larvae are meat eaters. It's a win-win-win situation to have these, so that's why you really would want to attract these into your garden, um, and I found these really open mini roses are um, um, they actually, they love, um, oh, oh, it just fell out of my head. It's the old fashioned, um, big open flat flower that always gets powdery mildew. Um, you cut them, cut and come again. Help me out, somebody. They come in pink and yellow and white. Um, not carnations, not... No. It's like an old fashioned plant that you normally don't find at most mainstream garden centers. You grow them from seed. Oh, somebody, somebody help me. It's, uh, okay, you know what? It's gonna pop into my head later. But big open flat flowers uh, are People really are good. Zinnias, cough. Yes, 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 Zinnia. zinnias. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's Friday at five o'clock on the East Coast, you know. Um, so zinnias, yes, things like that. But again, I didn't know that. I planted zinnias and I just and sat and would watch them for a couple minutes and see what would happen. But they like those open uh, plants. Also, these guys, the ones that hover when they fly, that's why they have this whole list of names, but they hover and they'll land on you and like put their little spongy lappy tongue on your skin. Um, they're not, they don't have a stinger. They're not going to sting. They're not going to bite, but they're really great to have around. And so that's why we want to encourage plants to have these guys around in your garden. And here's another picture. I think that's sitting on a dill bloom there. And you can see his little sponging mouth part uh, lapping there. So What's also important is, you know, you say, hey, plant zinnias, but a zinnia is not a zinnia. Same thing with like Minardia. And this is also uh, some of the pollinator trial work that was done at Penn State. They found that there's differences between cultivars of plants. And so that is something that's also important to look at. So you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of plant selection, um, you know, Breaking up your monoculture is step one, but if you really want to dial it in, you've got to look at research like this. Um, and again, if you're in the Northeast corridor, you're really lucky because Penn State has done such extensive work on this, which should be replicated in other parts of the countries. And I'm sure people are working on this in other areas. Um, but again, with uh, the Minarda, and I know there's information about this on echinaceas because some of the newer echinaceas really don't um, have any really pollen nectar resources. Um, and you say this here with some of the asters where you can see a difference between the cultivars there. So that can make a difference. Also flower shape matters. You know, we've bred roses to be these big, big multi-petaled blooms, but the beneficials really struggle to get in there to the pollen and nectar, where when you have the old-fashioned roses that are more open, you, they're more successful at getting in there and getting to where the food source is. So you have to think about flower shape too. Now I am thrilled. All of a sudden this year, it's like a light switch went on in the gardening world, and we've decided we're actually going to think about fall yard cleanup and the impact on beneficials. I think the first interview somebody had me do about this was about 10 years ago. And it was a very unpopular idea of allowing your brush and sticks and leaves to stay in your yard. But you know, hey, that's where the bugs are in the winter time. And we need to protect their habitats so that they can survive. Um, I think this is the biggest text slide I've ever done because I'm not a huge fan of lots and lots of text. But I just wanted to give you examples of insects in the Northern areas, again, this is going to be different in the southern areas because they don't have to overwinter. Um, beneficials and other insects, they can overwinter on the plants. So you think about a lot of the moths can actually pupate on the plants. Praying mantis eggs, which is up on the top right there in that pictures. If you go in and you cut back and remove branches and remove weed stalks and burn them or put them in the trash, you could be removing those beneficials there. Um, Insects uh, that can uh, use the stems, a lot of the solitary bees can be overwintering in stems. Also grasshopper eggs can be laid in stems. 
I know a lot of people are like, ooh, we don't want grasshoppers, but grasshoppers are an important food source for birds and they're part of the ecology. Leaf litter is important. Luna moths are down there. Uh, the spotted lady beetle, it's a Comia megilla maculata. It's my favorite ladybug. I've managed to catch it twice now in springtime where I've been in my yard and they just come bubbling litter in the beds and it's just amazing to see all these pink ladybugs come out of the ground because that's where they're overwintering. Also serpent fly larvae that we talked about, they're in leaf litter down there. Um, bees can pupate down in the soil, the bumblebee queen, so they're pretty safe down there because that's a pretty stable environment that we're not taking up. Also, um, and this is a whole other subject too, is uh, dragonflies, they actually overwinter in water areas um, as, you know, creeks and streams and stuff. And a lot of people don't think about that during the winter, all those beneficials are down there in that water. Also cracks and crevices. Um, this is where your adult lace wings, which uh, lace wings are beneficial that everybody should know about because they are so, um, they're such good beneficials to have out there. They're used a lot in pest management programs. And other ladybird beetle species um, overwinter in cracks and crevices. Um, and again, when we clean up, remove all these sites, we're taking away their protection for them. The, the leaf litter is like an insulation layer, even for, um, the trees to insulate their roots. Uh, you know, you want your yard to look tidy, but at the same time, you need to think about this stuff so you can provide habitats for them. There are a few examples though, like with tomatoes, you never want to leave any parts of your tomato because if you've had any kind of blights, the blight can overwinter on the tomato debris in your garden. So sometimes there are examples when you do want to get that all out. But a lot of the stems of, you know, our, our landscapey ornamental plants, those are the kinds of things we do want to leave and some of the leaves around. Now this is a picture of the, our front front field in front of our house. So we sit on seven acres. Our front field I think is about two acres. When we moved in, this was a pristine lawn. You could play baseball out there. In fact, I was trying to find a picture. I mean, it was just nothing. And we planted a ton of trees and we've kind of let it go back to nature through the years. Um, the problem we're having and, you know, is with invasives. You know, we want to allow food resources for the beneficials because it's been very interesting this year since I've been in Stockholm to go out and observe the changes of the different insects through the different times of the year. And this was Jake taken just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the purple flowers, those asters that are in bloom, it, it, it hums with bees. I actually saw more honeybees out on those plants this fall than I had all summer. So it was really important to have, you know, this food resource for them late into the season um, so that they could get the last food um, for the end of the year. But at the same time, we're starting to have a problem with invasive encroachment. So we decided to wait. And once they were all done blooming, everything had gone to seed this last weekend, my husband went out with the bush hog and mowed down a lot of stuff. Now, I went out with uh, stakes and staked important plants to save because there are some really um, special native plants I have out there. And then also, and it's a little hard to see on the right, he didn't mow that front right part and he left patches around. But he also left all the, the cut debris down on the field. So now the sticks and everything is still there, but we really need to get ahead of the multiflora roses, the Russian olives and things like that coming up. So I'm kind of interested to see, cause I'm gonna seed more native seeds plants out there this fall. I'm interested to see what happens next spring out there. One thing that we do have to look at is who stays and who goes. Um, is it really a pest? Is it dead? Is it helping you out? Insect ID is, is challenging. It's hard. The internet has made it a lot easier and things like iNaturalist are amazingly good and uh, with Google Glass and things like that, but sometimes you still need some help because a lot of people like stink bugs, oh they're bad, but look at this, there are predatory stink bugs um, and here they are feeding on, uh, feeding on a caterpillar. So it's important to get more than just is it a stink bug? We need to know what kind of stink bug, if it is an invasive or beneficial. Same thing with ladybird beetles. It's really important to understand what their different life stages look like. This one on the lower right is that uh, pink spot ladybird I was talking about. 
But on the left hand side, that white fluff ball there, that is a species of ladybug larva. And a lot of people do not recognize that as a ladybug. They would see that and think they have a mealybug or a scale. So it's really important to identify what you do have. Um, if you do not own this book, buy this book. This is um, from the University of California. It, is, it gives you all the different life stages of the major beneficials you're gonna see. I think it's one of the best books out there and it's very affordable uh, because unfortunately a lot of the biocontrol books are very expensive. I think this is maybe $25, $30 and you can find it used. Um, I do have on my website, if you go to the home page on the left, there's a book list tab, and this is just the top snippet. Um, I have links to all different kind of, there's a bunch of free books online that you can use for insect ID, um, but these are some of the books that I recommend because they actually have a book that came out, um, and again, only for the Northeast people, but it's a field guide to the surfeit flies in the Northeast, and that's a phenomenal book. But um, I list here books that I use and that I find are worth spending the money on uh, there. But um, another place to get them identified is, is through the internet. Um, the Bug Guide is probably one of the best vetted website out there. They actually have uh, entomologist specialists in their areas going through the pictures and helping people with ID because it would be really interesting to do like a survey of the internet and find out how many insect pictures are actually wrong, the identification, because I see a lot of wrong ID out there, especially on blogs and unvetted uh, websites, so be very careful. Same thing with Facebook groups. There's some great insect ID groups out there, but you have to make sure um, that whoever IDs it for you is qualified to be identifying it for you. Extension always can help you out, and also Twitter. There's a lot of uh, entomologists out on Twitter. That seems to be where most of the specialists congregate if you do need help. And so Twitter is a good place um, to find entomologists that are willing to help with ID out there. So one thing with ID is we always wanna get decent pictures because we can't always be there in person. Um, on the left is a little clip on uh, microscope uh, that will give you higher, better resolution. You can get these from five to about $30. Um, the challenge with these is now, since I have a Galaxy and the phone is down in the middle, none of these clip-on ones fit on it. Also, if you want a case, oh no, now you can't use it. So I have found them nearly impossible now to use. If you have a phone where the camera's on the side, um, they may work better for you. I'm a huge fan of the Dynalite, which is on the right. Um, entry level, they're about $100 and you can pay as much as you want. It's a USB microscope that takes stills, time lapse, and videos. I encourage all my professional growers to buy this. They can just snap pictures on their cell phone and then text them to me. And then right there, I can ID if it's a problem or not. Um, uh, if you're an avid gardener, I would highly recommend getting one of these because then you can see what's going on in the undersides of your leaves on your computer screen and you can, you can really see and learn a lot. It's an excellent tool um, to have there and because it's really tough to identify from bad photos. Um, I, I mean, I, I just tell people, you got to meet me halfway. If you want to help IDing things, you at least have to have a decent photo. The one last thing I'm going to mention is about pesticides. Um, and again, my goal overall is to reduce pesticide use, but I do understand sometimes we do have to do that. You've got to be smart about it. And it's been really great working in this industry and seeing how much the agriculture industry has changed over the last 30 years and how they've gotten away from the just spray all the time, kill everything. Um, and we definitely are going with the softer approaches first. Um, and because pesticides are becoming more expensive uh, for farmers, you know, they really try not to use them um, because the cost. If you do have to use a product, um, and not all homeowner products will be listed, but several companies like BioBest, Copert, um, BASF, AgroBio, they all have free information. IOBC is for paid information but they have these databases where you can put in the active ingredient on a pesticide and then you can put in insects and it doesn't have them all, but it has a, a good cross-reference representation um, and then see how it impacts them. So right here, this is from the BioBest website and by Fintrin. This is a very, very 
common home pesticide that people spray around windows and floors. It's used in turfs and on shrubs. It's, a, it's inexpensive, so it's used quite heavily. Bombus are bumblebee species. And so right here, this little S stands for if it's sprayed. If it's sprayed on a plant, that means for 10 days, bumblebees can't really get back in there, um, that it's going to have an adverse effect. When you look at Chrysopa here, that's, those are green lace wings. You spray this on a plant, you can't get green lace wings back onto those plants for more than eight weeks. That shows you how long this pesticide persists. And the same thing coleopter with your beetles like ladybugs. So, you know, understanding the long-term impacts of these spray products is really important. And I think these tables um, help people understand um, how, how long these products can be um, impactful on beneficials. It doesn't mean it's going to control pests for that long. Not at all. It means how long is this going to basically be harming your beneficials. Um, so if you go in and, you know, look at soaps, a lot of the stuff soaps on contact will kill them. But once the soaps are dry, beneficials can live on the plant right after that. So they are considered much more compatible. But I think it's important for people to understand really the impacts of these products out there, which most people don't, because they're like, oh, if I can buy it, at a garden center and use it, you know, it must be safe. So you just have to be very careful about how these use these products and the impacts um, on your native beneficials that you have out there. So with that, I think I might've gone a minute or two over. Sorry, I was trying to keep, trying to keep it short. But uh, I guess, uh, does anybody have any questions? Or why, well, I, I don't know, Ashley, you wanna take back over? Sure, thanks, Suzanne. See, I think we're actually going to pass to Sherilyn to go through. We, we do have a few questions in the Q and A here, so I assume she's going to read them, so I don't have to go okay. back and. Yeah, you want to? Yeah, I can read them, them to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Okay, so the first question is from Linda. Um, what beneficial would you suggest planting for cannabis plants? She's in Zone Nine B, Southern California. Well. I, you know, that's kind of, I mean, if, if, if you're growing outdoors, which I think I know who you are, actually, um, you know, I, I would follow kind of those guidelines of just having mixed plantings, but I also, and this is what I tell my growers always to do, look at your crop, look at cannabis, what are some of the key pests, spider mites, thrips, um, so do not plant plants that are prone to spider mites and thrips. What are prone to spider mites and thrips? Marigolds. So, you know, marigolds are out. So I wouldn't do that. Um, you can grow zinnias and grow nine, but you know, it gets a little warm for them. Um, lantana could be a possibility, but lantana is prone to white flies and cannabis can get white flies. So that would be another iffy thing. So, I would look again for plants that are not prone to the pest that cannabis is prone to, but alyssum in the off season, you know, during June, July, August, not happening. But over the winter months, if you're growing then outside, um, you know, alyssum would be great because that's perfect weather for growing something like that and it's low. Um, also ornamental peppers are really good because those you can inoculate with aureus, the minute pirate bug, um, and those can be used. Um, but yeah, zone nine is going to be different than what we do up north. But again, I would definitely stay away from things that are that, like, I wouldn't do basil. There's this big thing about planting basil with cannabis, but basil is very spider mite prone. So I wouldn't want to do that either. So. Okay, so second question uh, was from Jessica. What is the most challenging pest you work with and why? My most challenging pest is definitely, well, in the 90s, it was opagona, which is the banana moth, because it lived in the soil and it would tunnel up into the base of plants. So you never knew you had it until your palm tree fell over. Um, it also would eat plywood. Um, and it's a caterpillar. But interestingly, the problem just went away on its own. We did a lot of work with beneficial nematodes and the nematodes controlled it really well. Um, but it was challenging to detect and it, we still don't know why the problem just stopped on its own. Right now, rice root aphid is one of the biggest challenges because of labeling issues. We can't use the products we need to use to manage it. That's one of the biggest challenge with, is with rice root aphid. And again, since it's in the soil, 
you don't know you have it, and it's really hard to determine population counts. Okay. Uh, next was from Margaret. Uh, where can she find full strength vinegar? Oh, I've seen it at like garden supply stores. Um, you basically want to find anything that's above 20%. So household vinegar is about 5%. Um, you can get it online in some states, but there are some restrictions on shipping in some areas. So I would yeah, check. it's a pretty strong acid. You need to make sure you're yeah. wearing gloves and Definitely. goggles when you're mixing that stuff up because it is an acid. Yep. Um, so do be careful with that. Uh, I can go ahead and read one. Um, it says, we can we rake leaves and put into the garden on beds or beneath bushes, et cetera? And also, if bees are overwintering in plant stems, when is the best time to trim them back? Later in spring or so, when the plants start to grow again? Yeah, so we have an elm tree right at our back door with grass underneath. And it's going to be, if we don't remove those leaves, of course, it's going to be like, three feet thick in leaves and it's going to kill the lawn it's going to be slippery so what we have been doing here and i don't know if anybody has studied really studied all this yet but we just take all the leaves and rake them up and then put them in like under under bed sometimes my husband will uh, mulch the leaves up and put them under the shrubs he'll put some out around trees and things like that i think one of the hardest things is people rake all this stuff up cut their stems put it in a plastic bag and send it off to the landfill, which d doesn't help it. But it's not that you have to save everything. I mean, we've been raking up our leaves for decades and we still have insects. But just, you know, when you go out, think logically, you know, here's the middle of my yard, it's turf. I, it needs a little grass here. So yes, let's remove them from here. But if it's in a more natural area, do we have to remove them all? What I've been doing, and I honestly don't know if this is the absolute best answer or not, um, is in springtime, once I start to see insect activity is when I'll go back and start snipping and breaking off all the stems and stalks and everything. I wait till I start seeing the insects emerging. And then again, for us, we're fortunate we have acreage. I'm not putting this stuff in a garbage bag and sending it to a landfill. I just take it and we have kind of like a, I don't want to call it a compost pile. It's a it's a green pile in the back that we can just put all the debris on. So even if those sticks are broken off and they're laying there, they'll still be able to emerge out of. But it's an area that we need a lot of more research in to know about timing of things like this. So we had a question about um, birds impacting beneficial. So someone said that they have noticed that their neighbors have a lot of uh, bees and pollinators in their yard, but they don't have as many, even though they have similar plants, um, but they have a lot of stellar jays in their yard and they're wondering if it's possible that the stellar jays are eating their pollinators. I know this much about birds. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could help you. Um, that is such not my wheelhouse. Um, I mean, I could see that happening, but usually your neighbor is pretty much the same kind of ecology almost. It's hard to believe just a few feet would make that much of a difference because what, the stellar jays aren't going to fly over there? So I, I don't know. Um, but I don't know if stellar jays, I don't know anything about them. Sorry. Yeah, I don't have a good answer there either. Um, I would suggest Wild Farm Alliance. Um, which is based out of Minnesota, but have staff in California too. They specialize in birds. So you might want to check with those guys over there. Let's see. I'm back on, sorry you guys. I, for some reason my internet doesn't like me this morning. Um, so the last question was a suggestion for wildware control. For, for what? I didn't hear what she said. Yeah. Where are you at? Oh, for wireworm control. Uh, so is this, well, and this is where you have to know more. Is this like a big farm or is this somebody's garden in their backyard? Because how we manage pests can be different. And I will say though, I have not had extensive experience with wireworm because I don't do a ton of vegetable work. That's not 
I say outdoor field vegetable work. I do more mm -hmm. protected ag vegetable work, but it is a, a beetle larva that's in the soil. I know there's been some stuff done, I think, looking at beneficial nematodes. I don't know. Okay. Is Julie actually? Is that's, that's what I was going to suggest is maybe beneficial nematodes. And yeah, the question was from Nick. He said it's a pretty big pest for our wheat as well as our rotation crops. Yeah. See, I, I've never worked in wheat. Um, but the thing is, is if you're talking 10,000 acres of wheat, you can't apply nematodes to that, where if it's, again, somebody in their backyard, they could. And so that's what it makes a difference. Also with the nematode, soil type makes a difference. <clears throat> if you've got heavier soils, nematodes can't penetrate down to them. Um, I, I, my guess would be it's going to be one of these timing things. Um, where you're going to have to time when the insects in a particular life stage, maybe with an insect growth regulator, or the microbial products are coming along more and more, these, these fungi that attack insects. Um, and I know BASF, uh, they have a Bavaria, Bavaria Bassiana product, and they've been running trials in some of the larger agricultural crops to see how this fungus can be used to manage insects. So stuff may be coming. But again, the cost of applying biocontrol agents, whether it be nematodes, microbials to large scale ag, it's just, it's still too expensive compared to conventional chemistries. So we are out of time. I'm gonna do one more question I think here and then um, we'll compile the rest of these and see if we can get answers to the people that, that asked them. Um, so the final question would be, uh, if you have any suggestions for managing aphids on linden trees. Um, we've had some uh, situations in Oregon where they were sprayed heavily and we just had these mass bumblebee die-offs and so. Oh yeah, um, no, I, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that story about the parking <laughs> lot and the yeah. netting, I mean, it's yeah. like the poster child story for the world now. Um, well, don't plant linden trees where you're going to have high traffic people. I mean, this is right plant, right place kind of problems. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that there could be potential with, again, biodiversity, encouraging some native beneficials. But I tell you, when aphids get going, I mean, it, it, it's like an avalanche trying to start them. I know that products like... Um, there's um, a compound off of wintergreen that is an attractant for beneficials um, that they've looked at those can, you know, we bring in enough beneficials, but it just, the beneficials just can't keep up. And, you know, your beneficials numbers go up here, but the human acceptable level is down here and the beneficials aren't going to catch up till it's up here to crash them. And it's too late for what um, our expectations are. Um, I think that at, at this time, time. I don't have a magic answer, but if I lived out there, I don't know if I'd put a linden tree in my yard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because unfortunately, you know, if it's a small tree, you could do a knockback of soap, which is going to have minimal impact on your beneficials. When you get these yeah. giant trees, you know, spraying them is just not feasible. And that's why people were using systemic pesticides. Yeah. Now, I, I will say one other thing, but homeowners can't get it. Some of the newer uh, products um, that are some of the synthetic chemistries, but they're so targeted. Um, some of these products they use on aphids that paralyze their mouth parts, they have minimal to almost no impact on beneficials and pollinators. I mean, there may be some, I, can't, I don't want to say all beneficials and all pollinators, but, you know, the, the compatibility stuff that's been done, it looks very good. So, you know, we can come in into a greenhouse setting and we've got aphids, but let's say we've got ladybugs feeding and we've got parasitic wasps parasitizing and we can come in and use these products to get a knockback on the aphids, but it doesn't impact the ladybugs or the parasitic wasps and then they can finish it off. But not all that stuff is labeled for landscape and it's not products homeowners have access to. Interesting. Yeah, the, the new stuff, I call them designer pesticides because they realize bringing pesticides to market today that a broad spectrum and kill everything, nobody wants that. You have to pick a pest and really hone in on a compound that can just get that little slice of the pie because we don't want to kill everything anymore. We need to just cherry pick that one pest out. And again, the pesticides are getting more and more sophisticated.